In the second video in our series, we're going to talk about Silo Theorem Part 2. And this is an intuitive understanding of how this theorem works. So let's recall what the setup is. You have a group G, and the size is P to the K times M, where the greatest common divisor of P and M is 1. So what we're doing here is we're pulling the highest power of a specific prime P out of the size of G. A Silo P subgroup is a subgroup that has this maximal size with respect to being a power of P. So its size is this p to the k right here while being a subgroup of g. The first Silo theorem was dedicated to showing that there actually is a Silo p subgroup. So we have at least one subgroup of this size. The second part of the Silo theorem is dedicated to understanding how different Silo p subgroups are actually related. So let's say we had two different Silo p subgroups h and k. Then the theorem says that there's a group element g in your big group so that H can be represented as G times K times G inverse. So I wanna talk a little bit about this. So this thing here is called a conjugate of the group K. It's actually a group itself. The name actually comes from the fact that we did the operation of conjugation. Now, one of the consequences of this statement is that these two Silo P subgroups actually be, have to be isomorphic. So the idea is we can construct a map from k to h, knowing that h looks like this, and the map sends any element little k to its corresponding element here, which is g, k, g inverse. To see that this is a bijection in the first place on the level of sets, uh, we can construct an undoing of this, or an inverse map, by multiplying by g inverse on the left and g on the right. So we can construct a map psi that goes from g, k, g inverse to k by sending any element in here, let's call it x, to g, x, g inverse, right? And if we do that, that's going to act as an inverse for this phi. So since we have a bijection on the level of sets, these two things definitely have the same size, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two because both of them are finite. Now, why is this thing actually a homomorphism? Um, we need to check the conditions of being a homomorphism. I'll just actually check one of them. So let's check multiplicativity. If you multiply k and k prime and apply this function, you get g, k, k prime, g inverse, whereas the product of 5k and 5k prime is g, k, g inverse times g, k prime, g inverse, and these two g inverse and g cancel to give you an equality right over here. And you can check this preserves inverses like 5k inverse is the inverse of 5k. Okay, great. So we get that two Silo P subgroups have to be isomorphic, but even stronger that if you have one Silo subgroup K, that any other Silo subgroup has to be a conjugate of it. So let's go ahead and actually try to prove this using some intuitive idea. Okay, so I've written the types of things that are involved right over here. So the proof of the first part of the Silo theorem involved a set and a group action. So we're gonna do the same thing here. So our underlying set is gonna be the set of left k cosets of g. I'm going to use this notation for it. Now, let's be careful. k is not necessarily a normal subgroup, but we can still use this notation to denote the left k cosets. So that looks something like gk over all g in the group. All right, so that's the set we're going to deal with. Now, the group action is going to be the group h that we don't know much about, and it's going to act on these left k cosets. So when you have a particular left k coset gk, H is going to, any element of H is going to do something to it. And a natural option here is multiplication of H and G in the group capital G. So this is going to be the action of left multiplication. Okay, so we actually need to check that this is an honest group action. First of all, if we take an element in H and act on a left K coset, the output is a left K coset. So that's good. Now we need to check things like the group action axioms. And I'm going to leave it to you to check that. It's typical in group theory that actions on the left by multiplication work out to be group action. All right, so let's think about the behavior of this action. So we have a bunch of different cosets. I'm gonna make them into this like large pile right over here. This pile consists of all of these different left K cosets, right? So a prototypical element in here looks like G, K. And now we have this group H that's acting on this. 
So what is H doing? Every single element of H, every little H, is gonna take this set of K cosets and spin them around. It's gonna map one to another, and one to another, and one to another, and maybe fix some of them. But it's gonna take them and jumble them up and spit something else out. Okay, so in that light, it would be good to know how the splitting actually happens. So first, let's make an observation about the size of this set here. How many left K cosets are there, period? Well, the number of left K cosets is the size of the group G, which is P to the K times M, divided by the size of the subgroup K. And K itself is a CeeLo P subgroup, so it has size P to the K. So the number of left K cosets is M. Now, the group that's doing the action is H, and that has size P to the K. When H acts on the set of left K cosets, it's going to split this up into orbits. So each element in this set is a left K coset, and each element of H is going to do something to that, and all the possible results after hitting by all elements in H is gonna take this GK and spin it around in this picture, and whatever it spins it around to is gonna be its orbit. Okay, so we got a bunch of orbits here, and, and this entire picture, all the left K cosets get split into orbits completely. So we'll split this set into disjoint orbits. Now, the orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that if you have this group H acting on this set here, then the orbit sizes have to divide the size of the group. So the possible options for these clump sizes is divisors of this thing, which are 1, P, P squared, all the way to P to the K. So we might have some orbits that have these sizes, and they're all multiples of p. So I'll put like a p slash for saying p divides their sizes. And then we have a bunch of orbits of size one. But the total number of elements in this set, the total number of left k cosets is this number right here, m. And m does not have p as a factor. So if we look at all of these different orbits, we can't have all of them being these sizes right over here from p, p squared onward. Because if we did, then the number of left k cosets we'd have in total would be a multiple of p, but it's not. So there has to be at least one left k coset whose orbit is itself. I'm going to extract that particular one out. I'm going to call it gk. Even though I've used gk here, we'll just ignore that. We're going to extract this particular left coset whose orbit has size 1 and use it to establish that H actually is conjugate to K. So extracting this left K coset, our statement was that its orbit size under the action of H on the left K cosets has size one. So that means if we look at this left K coset and the result of hitting any element of our group H on it, we're gonna get this left K coset itself. This is true for any H. So it seems like we're actually getting close to this um, concept here. If we rearrange this, this is saying that G inverse HG times K is K for any H in H. Okay, so what that means then is if we look at this element right over here for a particular value of H, this is gonna be in K because this times something in K is something in K itself. Okay, so this object here is an element of K for any H in H. So if you look at this particular subgroup here, G inverse capital HG, which is obtained by multiplying G inverse by elements of H times G running over all H, this thing is a subgroup and it, all its elements lie in K, so it's actually a subgroup of K itself. If we rearrange this by multiplying by G on the left and G inverse on the right, we can reword this as saying that H is a subgroup of this group right here. So we're close to having equality. We know right now that H is actually a subgroup of the group on the left. How do we get equality? Well, we mentioned earlier in the video that this thing has the same size as K. So it has size P to the K. And the reason it has the same size as capital K was because we had a set bijection between this and capital K itself. So here we have this subgroup H, but it's also a CeeLo P subgroup, so it has size P to the K as well. So you have a size P to the K group sitting inside of a group of size P to the K, 
That means this has to actually be equality. And so we get that these two subgroups are actually equal. Very cool. So a nice way to see that if you have two CELO P subgroups, then they have to actually be conjugate to each other. And as a nice consequence, they're actually isomorphic to each other. In the next video, we're going to look at the third part of the CELO theorem, which actually gives you a way of deducing conditions on the number of CELO P subgroups in general. And after that, we're going to see examples of using the CELO theorems to actually say something about the structure of groups of different sizes. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.